Thank you for your presence. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We pray that we will come to a clearer understanding of your grace and how uh, we're to receive it and how we're to live it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. We know that your word never returns void, and we will never regret applying it and living it in our lives. Help us to love it. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, we've been talking about amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I think you figured out by now that I want to be really thorough on this subject because I believe it is the foundation of who we are as Christians. If we do not understand uh, grace, then we do not understand our, quote, religion, unquote, at all. Today, I want to talk to you on the subject of belief or faith and behavior. I want to talk about how those two relate. I want to talk about uh, what God's part is in our relationship, because if we do not understand His part, then we cannot do our part, which our part is simply to receive, to repent of the direction that we're going, and then to receive the grace of God. So the question that I want us to consider for our thinking this morning is, since grace is by faith and not by works, does our work matter? Does our good deeds matter? If you would look at Ephesians chapter 2, you should have these three verses that we're about to read memorized. I would encourage you to memorize these three verses because they're some of the most important in Scripture. Let's stand together for the reading of these verses, verses 8 through 10 in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Thank you. You may be seated. I want you to see that... We cheapen grace when we look at it as our fire insurance. Have you heard that phrase before? It's the idea that all I've got to do is go to a Billy Graham crusade, pray a simple prayer, and then the deed is done, and then I can just live however I want. I want you to see two prepositions in our text today. The two prepositions are by and for. By grace, for good works. It's not by works and by work, uh, good works. It is by grace, for good works. And it says in this scripture that this is what we were created to do. Okay, And this is the whole point of Jesus coming, to set the example because he lived the perfect life to show us how to live and then to empower us to live a good life because it is impossible for us to live a good life in our own strength. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are trying to keep the do's and not do the don'ts in order to live the life, but they're living it in vain because they're living it without power. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ. So this is a way to know if you're in Christ. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. You see, when we're saved, the Bible says that we are born again are created again in Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of our being created again? It is for good works. Now stay with me. Good works are good. See if you can keep up with this. It is good to do good works. Are we 
judged then by grace or by works? The simple answer is yes. Both and for your salvation you are judged by grace because Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us and since He paid the penalty for the price for our sin then we are completely justified and uh, we're in right position to be able to go to heaven. But after our salvation you and I need to understand that our works are going to be judged. It says in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Now, if you think about the evil things that we have done because of Jesus, Jesus took care of those. So the only thing left for a believer is for the good stuff to be judged. Okay. Now, if you're an unbeliever, then the book's going to be thrown at you at some point because you are, there's no way that you're going to be able to justify yourself. And so you will stand in a very bad position in front of a just God. Revelations 20, which remember is after the rapture has happened, okay? So believers have already been taken up to be with God. It says in verse 13, The sea gave up the dead and that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Okay? So there's, there's a coming judgment. Each person, in this instance, it's lost people, judged according to what they had done. 1 Peter 1.17 says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You see, what we've got to understand is from the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ, whether you were a child or a teenager or an adult, from that moment until you graduate out of here, either by going through the process of death or by hearing the trumpet sound in the sky and being raptured with the church, in that period of time, the word is very clear that you and I are suddenly finding ourselves on a mission trip. We are strangers or aliens in this world. We are just passing through. So our life now has an eternal perspective because we want others to know the good news that we have obtained. How selfish it would be for us not to share with anyone and everywhere one we can that you can receive the free gift of salvation. Matthew 16, 27 says... For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. You know, this, when Jesus comes with His angels, see, that's the second coming. And we haven't, we're going to have a series on all that one of these days, and we haven't got into pre-trib, odd-trib, post-trib, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, in the pre-trib view, this is the second coming of Jesus. He's coming uh, to... Um, take care of, uh, there's going to be a huge judgment that comes when he comes. And it says, each person, Revelations 22, 12, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they've done. And that's Jesus is the person who's going to be doing that. It's belief and behavior. And we need to be able to discern between the two. Here's the difference. Our belief determines where we will spend eternity. That's what it means in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved it's our belief that tells us where we're going to go, either heaven or hell. But it is our behavior that determines how we will spend eternity. If you're saved, heaven. If you're lost, 
hell. That's the place. But your behavior will determine how many rewards you will receive in heaven. It will determine your degree of responsibility while you spend eternity in heaven. It will determine the degree of punishment. If you're an unbeliever, it will determine the degree of punishment that you will receive because of your sin without a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we store up, not for God, but for ourselves, treasures in heaven. So anytime that you do something that's good, and we're going to talk, there's a lot to talk about here. We've got a lot to get in quickly. But whenever you do something good, then you are storing for yourself, not God, a treasure. It's not a down payment on the streets of gold. You've already got, you're already inheriting those. It's something much more important and much deeper than that. You remember the parable of the talents. You remember that the um, servants were each given a certain number of talents. One was given one uh, and, and, and uh, two and then five, and uh, they were given the opportunity to invest those talents. One was considered an unfaithful servant. Two were considered faithful servants. When the faithful servants were rewarded, Warded in verses 17 and 19 in Luke 19, listen to what the master says. He says, well done, my good servant. That's what you want to hear when you get to heaven. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. And then in verse 19 it says, take charge of five cities. So, I mean, if you're faithful in this life with your gift of salvation you're probably going to be in charge of something for eternity in heaven. I mean, we're just not going to be sitting on a cloud eating bonbons watching what's going on down here. I'm sorry. Now, I do believe that it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, and I do believe our loved ones are aware of how we're running the race down here. I do believe that. But they are not worried about it for one instance because there's nothing to be worried about once you've crossed over to the other side and you're spending your eternity for Jesus. The Bible describes two judgments. One is called the judgment seat of Christ. That's number one on your outline. And the other one is called the great white throne judgment. Okay, And that's point number two on your outline. At the judgment seat of Christ, everyone present is a believer. Okay, That will be those of us in, in this room who have placed our faith in Jesus. The sheep and the goats will, be, will have been separated. Okay, At the great white throne judgment, everyone there is an unbeliever. They never received the free gift of salvation. So it is not determined at the judgment whether you go to heaven or hell. That's determined on the earth by the decision that you make to believe or not believe. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Okay, So that's why we have to get it right before we die. But after our death, we will face judgment. If you have given your life to Jesus, then there will be no more uh, uh, chances uh, to change anything at that point, but your works are going to be judged. Let's look at this further by looking at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And remember, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. It says in Romans 14.10, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Now, the Apostle Paul dealt with a lot of issues in the church, a lot of issues of division, and he was wanting unity. You would have some that say, well, Apollos led us to the Lord, and so we want to do things the way Apollos did. And then others would say, well, Paul led us to the Lord, so we want to do things like Paul did. Um, 
Paul says it's okay to be different, but you have to be unified. And it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. Well, that each one is you and me. We're the each ones that are building on the foundation that the Apostle Paul has laid, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. It says in verse 11 in 1 Corinthians 3, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, okay, see the two different qualities of materials. We have material that can be refined by fire, and we have material that can be burned up in fire. Keep that thought, verse 13. Their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Each person, that's you, that's me. Verse 14, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive, underline it in your Bible, a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So in other words, what you do with your life once you've been saved, you're going to receive rewards directly given to you by God the Father. If you don't work and do the work that God gives you to do, then this scripture says that you're going to still go to heaven. You're still going to be there. But you're going to be so barely there that you're going to still smell like smoke. Isn't that what it says? Okay. Still going to be a little smell of hell in you, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 6, verse 1. He says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. I want you to see the key here is motive. Are we doing good things to be seen by others? Or are we doing good things to give praise and love and adoration to our Savior? Verse 2. So, for, And this is for instance. This would be an example that Jesus gave. For when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and understand that there were these boxes that were called trumpets and their money was coins, and so the rich, including the religious leaders, would just stand there and drop their coins, and you could hear them hitting the bottom. And they go, oh, he's giving a lot of money to the treasury, you know. And so they go, oh, isn't he a wonderful follower, you know. Isn't he great, all right, because he's, they were doing it to be seen, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you, that's you, give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So, we're either going to receive rewards or lose rewards depending on the motive for which we did something good. It's not just doing good stuff. I mean, if you're doing all your good stuff so that people can say, oh, that Mike Kessler, he is just the most wonderful Christian I've just ever seen. Look at all that good stuff that he's doing. If that's the reason that I'm doing it, I'm not getting any reward in heaven. I just got it. I just got all the reward I'm going to get, the pat on the backs from everybody else. And notice again, it is our Heavenly Father. It's not any angels or anything else. It's our Heavenly Father Himself who gives us the rewards. 1 John 2.28 says this, And now, dear children, continue in Him so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. 
Did any of you grow up like I did and you heard your preacher or your Sunday school teacher say something like this? Well, you might not ought to go to that movie because if you go to that movie and you're sitting there and Jesus comes, you're going to be embarrassed. Did anybody ever say that to you? That's what they used to say to us when we were kids, you know, so I ought to be careful where I was. That's kind of the picture, but not totally. It's not really uh, about being ashamed at that moment when he comes. The question is, why would a believer be ashamed when Jesus comes? Because it will be at that moment. We will know how we spent our life from the moment we were saved until the moment Jesus came. We will know that. And if we wasted our life and focused our life on physical things rather than eternal spiritual things, then yes, we're going to be ashamed. We're going to have regret because we never got around to it. And that's what happens. Well-meaning people, you know, when I retire, I'm going to do it. You know, when the kids are grown, I'm going to start, you know, tithing. I'll have more money then. Uh, you know, when the, when the kids go off to college, I'll, I'll be able to serve then. And, you know, we just put it off and put it off and put it off. We've got to make our time count now because it's all we've got. And we are not promised tomorrow. We don't know someone in this room is next. Do you know what you're next for? Graduation exercises. Someone in this room is at the end. So it would behoove all of us to spend every moment that we have focused on spiritual things and know that when we do it for the right reason, not to be seen by men, we're going to receive rewards from our Heavenly Father. And even greater than that, we're going to hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's look at the second judgment. It's the great white throne judgment. Every person that attends this judgment is a non-believer. Why is it called the great white throne judgment? Well, in Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Okay, Jesus. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Wonder what's in those books. I think it's all the deeds that we did. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. How do you get your name written into the book of life? When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then it says the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. We're talking about belief and behavior. If you believe, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But if you don't believe, then there are books that have recorded both good and bad deeds in our life. It says in verse uh, 13, The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Now again, understand, believers are already gone. gone. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We're not involved in this judgment at all. But unbelievers are now getting their uh, judgment. So sad to have to receive a judgment that was not necessary. But I want you to know that there are degrees of punishment in hell. There are degrees of agony and suffering, so to speak, in hell. Because a decent, good person who never gave their life to Jesus Christ, maybe the agnostic, Maybe all their family knew the Lord except them. They're going to be separated from that family who had a personal relationship with Jesus. But 
will they receive the same torment as, say, someone like Adolf Hitler, who killed six million Jews and then five million others? Absolutely not. There will be a different degree of punishment. Why? Because God is just. That's the whole reason we needed Jesus. It's because God is both loving and He's just. And so if you reject or refuse His love, then because He's a just God, then He is going to have to allow His wrath to come in. And everyone in that situation will be judged according to their works. So you go to heaven if you believe, you go to hell if you don't, but look at the degrees of judgment if you go to hell. Matthew 11, verse 20 says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have been repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes." These two communities, Tyre and Sidon, they're well known for tormenting the prophets of God. Verse 22, it says, But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. What does that phrase, more bearable, mean? It means there'll be less suffering. It won't be as bad for you. Verse 23, And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember that those cities were completely destroyed? He says, if, if they had had the same opportunity that you've had, they would have repented and got things right, and you, you wouldn't be talking about Sodom the way you talk about Sodom now, because the city would still exist. Verse 24, but I tell you that it'll be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Okay, so what you have here is you have an area, if you could make a circle around the Sea of Galilee, there's kind of a, a, a triangle there that includes Capernaum and Sardis, and it was in that area where Jesus did his miracles. It was in that area that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people became believers. They became a part of the sect in Judaism called the Way. They became followers of Jesus Christ. They were just like us. They lived in the Bible belt of Israel. Okay? The people who live in a place like we do that's heavily penetrated with the gospel. Churches all over the place, Christians everywhere will have it worse than those who are in some remote place in Africa that only heard the gospel once and rejected it. You notice when our missionaries go to a place where the gospel's never been presented, there are so many people that, that make a decision right then, the first time that they hear it, but there are other people that reject they will have it easier in hell than those who live where we live who have rejected the gospel. Are you with me out there? Okay. Notice this scripture about unbelievers, Romans 2, 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. It says, because of your unrepentant heart, that the wrath of God is being stored against you. I mean, it's just almost hard to take. You know, I, I just wish I could make the decision for people. I mean, I just cannot stand the thought of any person that I would know that would choose to reject something this good and would spend an eternity in hell. So here, there it is. There are the judgments. You can give your life to Jesus Christ 
And then you can look at your salvation as fire insurance and your behavior never change. It's true. You can believe in Jesus and do whatever you want. Sometimes, a lot of times, maybe that person's not really saved, but a lot of times they are saved. But they do not understand what they received, and they're not living it, and they don't understand how awesome it's going to be in eternity to receive our rewards, to receive our responsibilities, and to live out what God has planned for us. Sin is a deadly disease that can only be cured by Jesus Christ. One more thing in closing on this message. The Bible also says that some believers will receive a stricter judgment. Do you know who those believers are? James 3.1 Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's me. That's many of us in this room. Now, if we don't answer the call to teach when God gives us the teach, uh, gives us the opportunity to teach, we're going to be judged for that as well. But we've got to understand the responsibility that we have because God has given us the gift to be able to teach the Word that we need to be able to live it. So, we'll bombard you with a lot of information today. But here's the bottom line. If you are a believer, are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? Is your speech, are your actions, are your decisions that you make for your family, the way that your money is invested, the way that your life is lived, your giving, your tithing, is it led by the Holy Spirit? If it is, then you're going to be just like what Jesus said. Your left hand's not going to know what your right hand is doing. I mean, there's going to be so much exciting stuff going on in your life that you're just going to be overwhelmed all the time by the beautiful love of God and the power of God and lives being changed and things happening all around you. It's, life is just going to be an exciting drama for you. But if you're not living by the Holy Spirit, then you're not investing in your future. You're not putting treasures for yourself in heaven. You're just wasting time. Because building empires on this planet and being successful in this life means absolutely nothing in the life to come. So I want to challenge us as mutual followers of Jesus to keep our eyes on Him and to stay in the Word, and to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Are you with me? Let's do it together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your Word. It's hard to understand it all. It's hard to grasp it. But you give us the spiritual eyes to see the truth. God, I cry out to you for any person in this room, religious or not, church member or not, who's play-acting, who's pretending but they don't really have a personal relationship with you. I pray that today we would surrender to you and experience the most awesome life, the most tremendous life that we could ever live. I pray for others in this room who have worked all that out a long time ago. God, I pray that we would not fall into the temptations of the flesh, but God, that we would be guided by your Spirit and what we say in what we do, and how we live our life. Give us opportunity after opportunity, together as a church family, to make a difference in this community. Because, Lord Jesus, when we believe in you, then you give us all we need to do your work. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that's going to move now. In your name I pray.
Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to worship together. We're ready to receive you for salvation, for baptism, for membership. Let's do that right now.